So Romans chapter 1, verse 18, says, For the wrath of God is revealed. Now, wrath, that's a great way to start a message. I come in here, go to church, I'm going to get cheered up. And right off the bat, it sort of reminds me of the Dickens uh, Christmas story. You know, Morley was dead to begin with. (laughs) <laughs> it's like, wow, there you go. There's a way to start a story. Um, but we have to remember that side of God. He's not some cosmic Santa Claus that's just up there, and then when all's said and done, he's up there, ho, 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 everybody just come on in. He is a God of love, and he is good, and he's benevolent, he's merciful, he's full of grace, but he's also a God of wrath. But it's not man, per se, that his anger is towards, but sin, So when it says that for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, he's not some capricious God who just on a whim here or there decides he's going to punish you or make your life miserable or in the end throw you in to the fires of hell. No, he has a reason. We have to understand that there's something that separates us from God from the very beginning of That's sin. He hates sin. He loves you. He desires that none should perish. No, not one. But let's read through this whole section first to get the context of it all. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God... They did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So, I, one of the things that strikes me when I read this passage is, you know what Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And also the Bible tells us that God's immutable, that he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Well, these same things that Paul is addressing here in Romans are things that we still experience today and will experience until the Lord comes back. And when he says that he's dealing with that God's going to reveal from heaven against his wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness, um, this unrighteousness, well, the ungodliness, it indicates a lack of reverence or devotion or worship of the true God. And it's a defective relationship with God. And unrighteousness refers to the results of ungodliness. So a lack of conformity in thought, word, and deed to the character and the law of God. The law of God is key. What is the law of God? That's what we're going to talk about to some extent here. But what's interesting is that it says that against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. 
So what is the truth that we're talking about? Well, we're talking about God's existence and or his sovereignty. So, but the, I think the key thing is, is like sometimes I read that and, and I just kind of blow over the word suppress. Sometimes the words that we, you know, we know what they mean or anything, but we don't really grasp what's going on here. But if you're going to suppress something, it's an, it's an active thing, right? I mean, you, you don't suppress something you don't know about. So if somebody's trying to uh, point something out to you and you don't want to hear it, you know, you can suppress it. You know, you put fingers in the air and go, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Okay. You're actively, it's an act of the will. Okay. This is a, an action where you suppress it. But if you don't know something's there, then there's no suppressing. You're just ignorant of it. So Paul's addressing, he says men. So he's talking about people, whether you're Christian or not. What is it that we're suppressing? Suppressing the truth and the truth about God. But what about people that don't know God? who don't know the truth, who don't know the law. But he says that we have a conscience, and then there's creation and the word of God. All of these things we are aware of. So when he says that They suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. So it doesn't matter who you are. If you're not a Christian, and I know for my personal life this was true, you have a conscience. But what this is really talking about is when it says God is manifest, well, he's manifest in a couple of ways. One in his creation. The evidence of God is all around us. We see it, you know, I, I don't care who you are or where you are. I mean, there are cultures everywhere understand that there is some kind of God or creator, something, some being, something greater than themselves. And we look at creation and we see that, I mean, anything from a beautiful sunset to, I mean, I've been out in the deserts, you know, Death Valley or wherever, and there, we're in a sin-corrupted world, and yet there's beauty in that. And it, it always amazes me. I think, what could the, the Garden of Eden could have been like? I mean, I mean, I can go in the desert and find you know, beauty. Or there's been days where it's like smoggy and you get this amazing sunset because of the haze of the smog. And you think, man, I mean, as much as sin has corrupted this world, there is still beauty to behold here. But God, um, he says that it's in his um, creation. He says that they suppress the truth And he says that what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are are clearly seen, understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead. So in creation, we have in Hebrews, it says that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament his handiwork. So we see that that this is the creation is speaking to us about who God is. Get organized here. Uh, Acts 14 says, Men, why are you doing these things? 
We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. So he's appealing to them. Say, look at creation. It's screaming at you about the existence of God. So what exactly are we talking about? I mean, a beautiful sunset or whatever, but I mean, what is it that we see in creation? Well, we see complexity. We see intricacy. We see machinery. We see interrelationships, things that are related in such a way that any part of that that gets taken away or anything that's added throws it off. We're in a turmoil now because the, there's those that you know, talk about global warming and that we're adding too much CO2 to the environment. Um, but why is that a concern? Because everyone's aware of how delicately balanced our environment is. Who balanced it? In, a, in apologetics, Christian apologetics, that's, uh, apologetics is, you know, Apollo, um, apologia is uh, Greek for, to provide a defense. And we always think of an apology as we're saying we're sorry, but um, in this context, it means to provide a, a defense. And the study of apologetics in, in Christian apologetics is defending the faith. And there's several ways to go about this. Um, but if you know, if you've been, I, I've mentioned that some of you guys that were in the men's prayer breakfast, I'm, you're getting a little bit of review here. <laughs> but we talked about this in the, in the men's prayer breakfast. But if you've been on a jury or in the selection process for a jury for you know a felony trial, they'll tell you, or if you watch TV, enough of the CSI shows or law shows, that you can get a conviction on a felony by, with enough circumstantial evidence. You don't actually have to have somebody there, the theater, or the video camera, but if there's enough circumstantial evidence, you can actually convict somebody of that felony. I mean, you know that Colonel Mustard did it in a library with the lead pipe because you have enough... Because you guys know the game of Clue? <laughs> so apologetics is like that. There's all different kinds of arguments. There's cosmological arguments, anthro, um, anthropic principle. There's teleonomy and all these things. But really none of those in and of itself proves the existence of God. But what it does is from, you know, for each one adds more evidence that makes the existence of God more probable to people. And so in regards to this, the creation, there's several that apply, but one of them is the anthropic principle about when Paul's saying that, you know, it's manifest, we look around and we say, how delicately balanced everything. It's as though it was all created for us, for our existence. Not just this world, but the whole universe. There seems to be an intent behind it. So science, some think is an enemy of our faith, but Bad science is, good science is our friend because good science tells us just how intricately designed creation is. And design needs a designer. It doesn't happen by chance, purposeless processes. One of the, the uh, anthropic principle is telling us how it explains how this world is uniquely de designed so that life can exist. 
that that same life can examine the universe, that this unique design cannot be the result of random chance probabilities. So life can exist. Um, we need, you know, life requires a very complex, specific set of circumstances to exist. And this is where evolution breaks down is they're always talking about how things evolve, but if you get to the, to how did it get started? They have no answer. I don't care if you're talking about Richard Dawkins, um, Richard Lewinton, uh, Gold, um, oh, sorry, I just left his name, uh, Dr. Eldridge. Um, any of these outspoken evolutionists, when you try and pin them down on, how did it get started? How did that first cell get created? They don't know. Because it can't. Chance processes, purposeless processes, cannot develop a code that goes into the DNA. You can take, and they've done this, they've tried to do it, take all the necessary materials, the right kinds of sugars, the ribose, the, the uh, bases, the amino acids, you try and mix that all together, it doesn't just naturally turn into DNA or to the kinds of proteins you need for life. And I'm a computer programmer, I know about code. It doesn't just happen on its own. You know, the computer codes all gets down to the ones and zeros with just ones and zeros, you can come up with programs after programs that are doing all, everything we do in this world nowadays is ones and zeros. You ever see the movie Matrix and everything? <laughs> when you finally figured it out, you know, it was like all the ones and zeros were showing up. Well, in the DNA code, you have four units, the four bases that are part of that code. Now, you might be able to get the helical formation of that DNA and those bases might line up on there, but there's nothing by the processes of chemi chemistry, biochemistry, that will force those things to align in a code. Anyway, I, I don't have the time to go into that, maybe a less than another time, but for life to form, it's very complex, highly specific information that needs to, and complex, specific information does not happen by chance. So there, and the, the other thing is that there's the four forces in the universe. There's a gravitational force, which we're all familiar with, um, weak nuclear, strong nuclear, and electromagnetic forces. You didn't know you were gonna get a little physics class today, did you? Um, Anyway, very little, because these forces are balanced to incredible precision, such that just the slightest adjustment one way or the other, and we're not here. Gravity, we understand. I mean, if gravity was too strong, then it would have start affecting our atmosphere. We'd probably start... Um, maintain more ammonia and methane and, you know, this planet would become uninhabitable. Or if there wasn't enough atmosphere or enough gravity, uh, we wouldn't have enough atmosphere. It, it's, so it has to be balanced just right and maintain that. How's that happening? And the, the nuclear forces, the weak and the strong nuclear forces are concerning the atoms Everything that's made consists of these atoms and molecules that form. Without these weak and strong nuclear forces, they get out of whack. All that goes away. Same with these electromagnetic forces. They're all balanced to such precision. So all of this speaks to that there's somebody that balanced them, there, it speaks to there was intent and we're it. It's all there 
And not only that, but one of the things he, that, that it purports is that that, um, that that same life can examine the universe. Do you realize that our we live in our little solar system, and that solar system's part of a galaxy? Of course, now there's, you know, a bazillion galaxies out there. But our galaxy is floating around in there, and in our solar system's in the Milky Way galaxy, right? So, but we are positioned in such a way that we can view the universe. If we were any deeper into our own galaxy, the, the backlight from all the stars would almost be impossible to see anything. So we're, we're on this perfect little world that's just the right distance from our sun so that we're not too hot, not too cold, it's just the right size for gravity to hold in an atmosphere. The moon is just the right distance away. And we're placed in a Milky Way galaxy that's in just a place where we can view the universe like it's all out there for us to examine. And the founders of modern science were like Newton and Pasteur. and They were Christians because they said... Because we believe in a God of reason and we're created in his image, then that reason is in us. We, and he's, he's designed this whole thing. We should be able to figure this out. So God was their impetus. The founders of modern science were actually Christians because they understood that this was so incredibly well designed. So I get excited when there's more scientific investigation, good science, not the science that presupposes there is no God, but the science that says, I'm going to go where the facts lead me. It always comes out to our benefit in genetics, molecular biology, whatever it is, uh, physics. But anyway... I spent too much time on that. Uh, what about when he talks about uh, that it's manifest? Let's see. What may be known of God is manifest in them. Okay, we've talked about the creation, but he says is manifest in them. And what he's talking about is the moral law. How do we know about right and wrong? And this is before, we're talking about man, the pagan, the, the unsaved, the, the uh, Gentile. And it's called the natural law. I don't know if you've ever heard the expression of the law of nature and the law of nature's God. I'll, if it sounds familiar, I'll tell you probably where you remember it from in a minute. But if you go over to Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 16, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, referring to the Mosaic law, the Pentateuch, by nature do the things of the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. So we have the law when God created us. He wrote the law in our hearts. So, There's evidences of this in scripture and references to um, that being the case from Genesis to Job. Um, Job especially uh, being the oldest book in the Bible. Because see, Paul was up against a lot of, you know, the legalists were 
you know, were saying in his day that there really is only the Mosaic law and everybody had to follow that. And Paul's kind of trying to fight them and saying, no, there, there was, there's the Mosaic law, but before that was the, the law that God wrote in our hearts. And so that's called the law of nature. And it's not nature so much like you know, going out and enjoying nature, but we're talking about the nature of man. And probably where you've heard this before is the Declaration of Independence. Um, That first paragraph when it says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds or bands, which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the laws, I'm sorry, separate the equal station which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinion of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which impel them to separation. So I know that there's a lot of those, you know, the secularists that want to say that our country was not founded by God or had had anything to do with it. And they even attack this phrase, the law of nature and of nature's God, saying that, well, that's, that came out of the Enlightenment, and our founding fathers were inspired by the Enlightenment, which was the beginnings of the humanist movement, modern humanist movement. And so that's what they were influenced by because, you know, I, I don't remember who it was, Rousseau or whatever had mentioned. But that's not true. They're referring to the law, what Paul is referring to, the law of nature and of nature's God. And that was what was, it wasn't the enlightenment that our founding fathers were inspired by. It was the Reformation. Because if you look in their libraries, you will see the books of of Blackstone, of John Locke. And John Locke was inspired by Rutherford. These were teachers out of the Reformation that were teaching the law of nature, the nature of man, God. You can read, the thing is, uh, these guys, you just go back, all of these, I mean, there's so much data out there of uh, our founding father's original works. I mean, just go read George Washington's farewell address. I mean, he's one of the ones they said, well, he was, you know, he was a secularist or at the best a deist. Go read his, his farewell address when he was leaving the presidency and you'll come away with a whole different opinion of who this man was. But anyway, so there is this law. It's written in our hearts. But what he's saying here in this verse in two, in chapter 2, he says that these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. That even though we have this conscience, it's just like the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law, the whole point of it was to tell people, this is what you do to be righteous. But the thing is, the law points to sin because there's no way you can do all of that. The whole Mosaic law was basically showing you how lost you are because there, you can't fulfill the law. And that was the same way with this law that's written in our hearts, our conscience. You, you think you live by your own standard. And there's probably things that you avoid because you know they're wrong but there's those times where you let them things slide and you do stuff that you shouldn't do. Well, you're condemned by that law. So you may think I can, you know, like I'm a good guy, you know, 
I think God's going to understand. I'll get there and I will reason my way in. But then let's see what he says here. Going back to 18. Um, Well, in verse 19, or 20, I'm sorry, 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhood, so that they are without excuse. There is no excuse. God still holds men responsible for refusing to acknowledge what he has shown them in his creation. Even those that have been, um, that have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel have received a clear witness about the existence and character of God and has suppressed it. If a person will respond to the revelation he has, even if it is solely a natural revelation, God will provide some means for that person to hear the gospel. As John MacArthur was writing that. So you see, God's not against you. He didn't write that law in your heart and then say there is no hope for you. It says in Acts, for I was passing, this is uh, Acts where Paul is going, is being taken up to Mars Hill. He's in Greece, Athens. And Mars Hill was where all the philosophers and thinkers would go up there and they would debate. There's there like a marketplace down below. And some had heard Paul speaking, and so they wanted him to go up on Mars Hill and present his ideas up there. So he says, as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, because on his way up there, you guys, I'm sure Ru, Pastor Rubens taught you this whole story, but... Um, he saw all these monuments to all these gods as he was going up there, and there was one monument that was to the unknown god. They were so afraid of offending, you know, a god that they they put a monument there just, you know, like, okay, well, we don't, maybe we're missing somebody, you know. <laughs> so um, he says, I was passing through concerning the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown god. Therefore, the one to the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in the temp- in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. So you see, he's saying he's out there. If you'll seek him, he's going to make himself known to you. And it brings to Mind, um, I, I heard a story, uh, it was a missionary talking about he got called to the mission field. I mean, he went through all this training and everything, and, he was, and they were going to send him to a tribe down in the Amazon jungle that was had very little contact with the outside. And, you know, he was nervous. I mean... He didn't know what he was going to say to these people. How is he going to be accepted? So, um, kind of a sideline. At one time when I was in college, I was 
I took a cultural anthropology class, okay? Anthropologists, you know, they go into, you know, it's kind of like what a missionary does, but, you know, they go into a culture and then they immerse themselves in that and then they record everything they learn and, and you know, write papers. And, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that comes out of that. And it kind of interested me and I thought maybe that's something I'd like to do. It was early in my college career. And so I took this cultural anthropology class and, <laughs> And the professor was saying that, you know, you know, that's what you do. You have to go in and you have to immerse yourself in this culture. And he had a friend that was uh, preparing to go to, likewise, like some, you know, tribe in deep, dark jungle somewhere. And he said, you know, the one thing you have to know is, his friend was telling him, okay, you, you know, as you know, you, you go in there. You don't go in in a, you know, a big boat with all your gear, you know, your, your computers and your, and, uh, medical, your own medical supplies and your own food and everything. You, you, go in a, you go in a canoe and you take, you know, some notebooks and pencils and you go there, you eat what they eat, you drink what they drink, and you, if you get sick, the witch doctor heals you because they're not going to accept you otherwise. You will be suspect at best. And so he said in the, this guy's process was, part of his process to get ready for this is he started drinking uh, straight vodka, and he said that he was doing that because they made a drink in their tribe very, very similar to vodka. Well, vodka is made of potatoes. So he was thinking, well, I, uh, what is it? There's some kind of a tuber or root or something. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, they, they take these, um, the, the women in the tribe go out and they gather this root from this plant. And they, they bring it back in to the village. And then they have these bamboo tubes which work like containers. If you've ever looked in bamboo, it's like you can cut it in its sections so you have a container. So then they chew on the root and spit it into this tube. And then they plug it up and bury it in the ground and let it sit for a couple of months. And then they drink it. Well, at that point, I thought, I think I'll be a biologist. <laughs> I, I mean, I... I'm okay with going into the jungle and living da 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 da. I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I said, you know, I am not. I get to thinking of that's what they drink, and I don't know what they eat. I like uh, that's kind of where I'm drawing the line there. But anyway, this guy was going to go into a situation, but of course, his intent was something totally different. He wants to reach these people with the gospel. But what he didn't know was. While he was going through all this preparation, this tribe, they had a religion that involved an idol. And the tribe had a, a designated person who made this idol. And the part of the religion was you have to make this idol exactly perfect. There can't be any flaw in it. Because if you create this idol and there's a flaw, you're dead. So the guy that was responsible for creating this idol, something about creation was telling him that this isn't right. There's something, things were not adding up as to this really being legit. And he would wander out into the forest and he was appealing to God And so he decided one time that he was going to make, create an error somewhere where nobody would notice and see what happened. So he did. Nothing happened. And so he started praying, essentially. I know this is false. I am making the God with my hands, but who is the God that made my hands? So this guy, this missionary, finally comes into this tribe, and of course, you know, they're all gathered, and then the chief, you know, if you don't get accepted by the chief and the high priest or whatever, then, you know, you might as well forget it. So he comes in, and he'd been praying and praying. He didn't know what he was going to say. But as they're all kind of looking at him, murmuring, and he's trying to explain, he goes, look, I am here to represent the God that makes the hands. 
that create your gods. <laughs> All of a sudden, <laughs> the, the guy that was their idol maker jumps up and he goes, he's telling the truth, he's telling the truth. And he tells the tribe his whole story. And start a very successful mission. So the point is, this is written on our hearts. Even people who are not Christians, they know right from wrong. And Paul referred to them saying, even your own poets. Well, it's amazing how close to Christian theology some of the Greeks and other of those ancient cultures got. Plato even though the Greeks were for a long time into, you know, these multiple gods, Zeus and his wife Hera and Apollo and Athena and, you know, Poseidon, the god of the ocean, and they had gods of the rivers, and and it went on and on and on. But Paul had come to the conclusion through reason that there was a god. There's a whole process, but it eventually became, he became, he, he understood that the developed what a monotheistic view of religion instead of this multiple and it was based upon just reasoning and logic and looking at things about him that became known as platonism and it was very prevalent in rome at the time that paul the apostles were around and john if you remember part of it is this is kind of interesting um Plato said that there, there's a realm of being and be, in becoming, okay? The way he worked this all out, I can't go into all the details, but the world of becoming is us, people, this world. Everything's constantly changing. One philosopher said you never jump in the same river twice because in between it's changed. There's erosion, things happen, you know how that goes. But the world of being this being is immutable, does not change. He's like the boilerplate that everything is, is taken from. Like the signet ring. You put the, the wax on the letter and you press the signet ring in. Okay, this doesn't change. Okay. But he, his, um, this was transcendent. It was, uh, you can't, there's no, there's a gap we can't communicate with him. He doesn't communicate with us. But this being needed someone to be a liaison between. So there was this entity called the Logos, which means word, that was the intercessor between these two worlds. Well, isn't that funny? Because now that kind of gives you an idea of what John was talking about. John chapter 1, verse 1, where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word means Logos. He's talking to a lot of people out there that were believing in this Platonism, and they knew that there was this intercessor, but they knew that this God was that it wasn't the God, it wasn't the being, there was, and there was no, and he's telling them, yeah, not only is he, but the intercessor is him. And that intercess, intercessor is Christ. And he came to earth. So that's kind of interesting when you look into that aspect of it. That what John was, you wonder why he was phrased it that way. So people were able, even though it's in creation, it's written in our hearts, and they could get so close, they understood people who did not know the Mosaic Law, people that did not know Christianity, it's, it's evident. So... 
Then in conclusion, now, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us, as that says, there's no excuses. So, I, you know, I've talked to people, and I know people, and I think I was even one of these people that said, well, you know, I'm a good guy, you know. I never killed anybody, you know. But it's not a matter of degrees, is it? So, you know, if someone's saying that, but, but I, you know, I listen to my conscience, and, and I believe there's a God. So why do I need an excuse or the gospel or whatever? I mean, he's a reasonable enough God, then I should be able to, you know, he should understand. I'll, I'll explain to him, you know, my situation. <laughs> well, let's go to Matthew 22. Um, verse 2. This is the parable of the marriage feast. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call these who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those um, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies destroying those murderers and burned up their city then he said to the servants the wedding is ready but those who were invited were not worthy therefore go into the highways as many as you find invite to the wedding so those servants went out into the highways and they gathered together all whom they found both bad and good and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him out into outer darkness there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth the wrath of god so here you have he invites these people out of the highways and the feast is ready so it's not like go home and get dressed and then come to the wedding it's like come so these people are coming to the wedding so Obviously, they don't have the necessary garments with them. So what we can assume here is that when they were going in, the host was providing them with the proper garments. I think what we're seeing here is this guy comes in and goes, nah, I'm fine, I'm good, look at me. But then when the host found him without the proper garments, there was no discussion. There was no reasoning. There was no explaining his position. It says he was speechless. See, we are without excuse. Don't think you're going to get into heaven because you're a good person and that you'll explain it to God because after all, he is a reasonable God. But he's also omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and he created everything. He gave you the chance. Also, if you think about that covering, if we go to Genesis, and I'm, I'm close, I'm close. <laughs> In Genesis, 
Remember in um, chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned, in verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. But then when they were kicked out of the garden over in verse 21, he says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. The covering they made for themselves was not sufficient. That's religion. When we try and, through our own works and efforts, make ourselves right to God, you can't. The veil in the temple when Christ was crucified was torn top to bottom. It makes it very clear Why would it say that? Why did it matter? Because God reconciles us to him. We cannot do it the other way. That covering, the covering, innocent blood. This is the first time innocent blood is shed. He had to, God slayed the animals, innocent animals, to provide a covering for Adam and Eve who had sinned. This was a type of the gospel. We know that there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Who can, who can pay that price but Christ, God himself in the flesh? Now the wedding guest, he didn't have the right covering. He didn't have the one that was provided by the host. So we cannot think that we can go into heaven because we're a good person. Because even by your own standard of living, I can guarantee you, you violated it. And one violation is enough to separate you forever from God. But then, finally... Even though you hear the gospel, you still have to respond to it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there are none righteous, no, not one. So, we have no excuse. I don't care if you're Jewish, Christian, Zoroastrian, a Platonist, or just flat out atheist, humanist. God is not going to listen to your excuses. But thank God he provided the covering we need. I don't know if there's anybody in here who is not saved. But if you are not, then you can come see me afterwards and I'll pray with you or Fausto, Pastor Fausto over here will pray with you. But seek someone out. You you don't want to go and face the wrath of God. 